I could have been one of those girls in Kabul. I could have been one of those girls in Afghanistan. If my mom wasn't fortunate enough to go across the desert in Afghanistan and finally cross the border into Iran, I could have been one of those girls. My, my brother and sister could have been one of those boys. It feels like this is the least that I can do right now. I feel like I have to do more. I have to spread the word. I have to donate more. I have to um, open my doors and, and try to help as many Afghans that I can. I can't. I can't turn them away because I remember the time when my father started when he uh, fled from the Soviet Union in 1981, and he was lucky enough to have people take care of him. So I want to be able to kind of give that opportunity to an Afghan who who is struggling, who wants to uh, escape that oppressive regime, and and try to give them a life that my parents gave me, or, or better. It's just sad that I can't do anything for my own woman, my own country. I've been to 48 countries as a US citizen, yet I will not be able to ever visit my own. So this movement is important. I'm thankful to be a US citizen. I'm thankful to be educated in this land, in this country. I'm thankful to be able to wear what I want to wear. Afghan woman, just like any other woman, has rights. And we all, as a country, need to stand up for them. This is why this, this global movement was important and touching to me. That's why I'm here. You know, a lot of the people that came from Afghanistan were fleeing the Soviet invasion. It's so nice to see that how welcome they feel in America, and, and especially in New York. Old Afghan men, like, playing chess in the park, um, community centers, mosques. Um, places where Afghans could gather and feel safe. It was all part of a, a bigger community. People felt they were at home. When the Taliban took control of Afghanistan on August 15th, a decades-long humanitarian crisis reached a nadir. Political instability is a familiar feeling to the over 10,000 Afghan Americans living in and around New York, and the over 150,000 living in the United States. Many arrived as refugees or asylum seekers following the Soviet invasion in the 1980s. Over a thousand refugees are expected to arrive in New York in the coming months. Empathizing with the refugee experience, Afghan Americans are rallying to support the lucky few who made it out, while urging the United States to do more to help the rest. My name is Zach Cosme, I'm from Queens, New York, and uh, I'm here helping to organize this event. I saw that this uh, event was going to happen worldwide, and I was like, oh, I should go to the New York City one. And I was scrolling through the list of cities, and I saw that New York wasn't on the list, and I was like, that's insane. So I messaged one of the organizers of the North American Committee, and uh, I was like, hey, do you need someone to help out with New York? Like, what's the deal? And they're like, yeah, we're actually looking for someone to, to kind of take this on and like start working on it. And I was like. You know, this is something that's super important to me. It's my people, you know, it's people that, it could have been me, you know, these, these people that are, you know, struggling to get out, it could have been me. Um, it could have been my sister, it could have been my mom, it could have been any of us. So, you know, it, it's, it's very important to me. So I was like, yeah, I'd love to get involved, um, get to work. So that's how it all started. We added people and now we have a team of amazing organizers that have worked for a couple weeks at this and uh, get this ready, get this started. Over the course of 48 to 72 hours, our government collapsed. Uh, very, very uh, similar, yet different to what happened 40 years ago. So my name is Fidishta Tayeb. I am the senior refugee interventionist, Cornerstone Family and Marriage Intervention. Uh, I reside in New York, and I'm also a board member of the Afghan American Foundation. This time around, we actually made a lot of gains in the last 20 years. We've had uh, women, get places in parliament, we've had women journalists, we've come very, very far, and now all of that has been taken away from us in a very short period of time. Uh, we have Taliban that are knocking at people's doors, asking them for girls that are 12 and over, 
We have uh, secret police forces that have been created by them who are going from door to door asking for women activists. Uh, we have not-for-profits that are being raided and their staff lists are being obtained. So this is, this is a very different way of dealing with the same crisis and a very different perspective. Now we've tasted this freedom, we've tasted democracy, and we want to hold on to it. You know, I am the product of uh, political refugees from Afghanistan. My mother was a political refugee who came here in 1980. Uh, this is a very, uh, very personal thing for me. It hits home to have been raised by someone who was displaced and who uh, faced what people are going to be facing in the near future. If my people can stand in sewage from five to seven days, and if my people can live on plastic bags, then there is, there is no excuse from somebody like me living in luxury that I have to keep pushing and I have to move forward and get what I need to get done. Under the Taliban regime, we would all be murdered, raped, or forced into marriage. I was meant to speak on women's safety today, but unfortunately, as Afghanistan regresses under the Taliban's regime, we are here talking about basic human rights. Let me tell you what is fundamental. Rights to freedom are fundamental. Freedom from torture is fundamental. Freedom of opinion and expression is fundamental. The right to work and education is fundamental. Women in Afghanistan are being turned away from their jobs today by the Taliban. They are required to be accompanied by male members of their family in public. Journalists and activists are in hiding or in flee. America actually used Afghan women as the veil to invading Afghanistan. Yes. Liberating Afghan women, they said. Let me tell you about Afghan women, since most people know them as only victims, right? Afghan women secured their right to vote before women in America. Yes. Afghan women are educated and resilient. Afghan women are creative and competitive. Of a lion, they say. We need to change the status quo, and the status quo is that's your community. It doesn't belong to me. It's none of my business. I can't help, I can't contribute. And if we continue to think this way, we will continue to live in silos, separated, and the only people who benefit from that is white supremacists. I'm here today not only as a fellow Asian American, not only as a minority or a son of immigrant like many here, but I'm here to be an ally. My name is Samira Youssef. I'm a second generation Afghan American child of refugees. And like many other members of the Afghan diaspora, I've been shaped by intergenerational trauma, survivor's guilt, an acute awareness of U.S. foreign policy in Afghanistan. I'm sure many of you, if not all of you, know how what we have seen unfold the last few weeks was an American-sponsored fiasco in the making for over 40 years, not 20, but 40. I myself have family there and have never felt so helpless, unable to assure them that they'll be able to leave as they desperately plead that I assist in any way I can. My cousin is an SIV applicant, approved applicant, given a decade of service with the United States and was told over a week ago now that he'd be evacuated with his wife, son, elderly parents, and three younger sisters, all under the age of 24, unmarried, fearful that they'll be forcibly married off to Taliban, if not worse. He's going from house to house, hiding from the Taliban, who are going door to door, looking for those who work with the US and allied forces. 
generations of Afghans will be negatively impacted due to the actions and failed policies of the U.S. government, with the justification being American fatigue. Over the last 20 years, more than 75,000 Afghan civilians have been killed and more than 78,000 Afghan troops and police, which is about 33 times the amount of U.S. forces, and these figures are widely understood to be severely underreported. So what about Afghan fatigue and massive loss of life? What about Afghan hopes and dreams? Two days ago, I called a friend. He needed some advice on how to apply for humanitarian parole for his family. And then he told me this, which I didn't know how to respond to. He said that he had relatives there in Kandahar, they're Shia. One of the relatives asked the Mullah, a religious scholar, he said, she said, she asked the scholar, she said, when the Taliban come, will God forgive me if I kill my daughters before the Taliban takes them? And then after that, will God forgive me for killing myself? And I didn't know how to respond to that. I really did not. For a mother to be put into a situation where she has to think about the safety of her daughters, death is better than living under the Taliban. I received a frantic text from my cousin who had waited 12 hours outside of the airport gates. He said, we're still at the airport and the Taliban are getting aggressive. We don't even have food. I said, I'm sorry. They're outside waiting and waiting and 36 hours later, they still were not able to get through to the airport. And again, I ask, why are the planes empty? Biden administration has given a deadline of the 31st, but life goes on after the 31st. We cannot give up. Thank you. Of my story. Why am I here? You see, I'm, I'm Uyghur, but my parents, they had to escape, and the nation they escaped to, to find refuge, a beautiful nation, I'll tell you, Afghanistan. <laughs> the stories your mom and dad told you. You see, I have those same stories. I'm not going to go into the depths and the gruesomeness of the stories that exist amongst this crowd. People say, how do you recover from PTSD? This is not pain. PTSD. This is TSD. It's happening. The trauma is current. To mention all of this, the Muslim community around the world, yes. stand yes. up. Yes. See the Taliban? They do what they do, waging my name, my, my identity. You see, as a Muslim diaspora group, as an international ummah, two strong my father says drip by drip the river flows but with two billion Muslims we have an ocean indeed we can do so much more it's always been the oppressor versus the oppressed we outnumber them you see it was Nelson Mandela that said South Africa is not free until Palestine is free I'll tell you that Palestine is not free until Afghanistan is free Afghanistan is not free until the Uyghurs are free. Stand up for one another. These are the people. These are the people that have no voices. They have no voices in Afghanistan. We must stand for them. When they come to this country, God willing, they will come to this country. Let them in. Let them in. Let them in. Let them in. When they get here, I've been working with points of contact at the military bases. Our people have come to this country with one plastic bag. One plastic bag with two days worth of clothing. They need our help. We are traumatized. We are going crazy. Our hearts are bleeding. Our people, mothers are being separated from daughters. Fathers are being separated from sons. Shame! person I want you to go home and register to be a foster care parent. We need you to save our children. Save our future. Save our still lives to come here. Give them that opportunity. Give them that voice. Take them before somebody else does. I am getting 15, maybe 100 to 200 phone calls asking me, where am I going to drop off my youth closing? Shame!
our lives at all? Is there any value to my life? Does the world know that we are people? Following the attacks at the Kabul airport just last Thursday, mainstream media filled with headlines reading, breaking, 13 American troops killed. But there was no mention of the 170 plus innocent Afghans who lost their lives. They referred to the innocent Afghans that they killed as collateral damage. A really disturbing term that fails to recognize the loss of a human life. We're framed this way intentionally. Collateral damage, it blurs the reality of what's happening. It creates a disconnect between Afghans and the world, and a desensitization to our agony and our pain follows. It seems the only time we are recognized as human beings is when they want to weaponize our struggles against us, while the oppression of our women is manipulated into propaganda, and our beauty is plastered on these magazines. There is no mention of the murders, abductions, and torture that Afghan men are subjected to. Humanization of men in Afghanistan is going to distort their message. They want to tell people that the West needs to save the helpless women in their blue burqas from the uncivilized men of their country. I stand before you all today to remind you that the loss of over 250,000 innocent Afghans is the loss of human life. To remind the world that each and every one of these people had a family, had aspirations, careers, and dreams. our music, our, it's so valuable. There is nothing more precious in this life than our own people and our own country, especially in times like this. Oh!